Welcome to the Cosmos in You podcast, where we interview scientists, philosophers, and leading thinkers to discuss the nature of our reality and the impact it has on our daily lives. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, The Cosmos in You. This is your host, Susanna Scully, and I'm very excited for today's episode. But before we get into that, a few bits of housekeeping is if you have not had a chance to rate and review us on iTunes, I would love your help in doing that as that is how the word gets spread about our podcast. Um, All of you have been so wonderful in reaching out to me and sharing with friends and I just so, so appreciate it. So if you could continue the love and get a moment to rate and review us on iTunes. That would be incredibly helpful and appreciated. So that's it out of the way. Now today, this is such a great interview. I'm really excited to hear what you all think of it. So today we have Mark Wallin, who is the director of the Family Constellation Institute and is North America's leader in inherited family trauma. And if you don't know what that is, we get into it into in uh, this episode. He's a sought after lecturer. He leads workshops at hospitals, clinics, conferences, and teaching centers around the world. He's taught at the University of Pittsburgh, the Western Psychiatric Institute, Kripalu, the New York Open Center, the Omega Institute, the California Institute of Integral Studies, And he's also the author of a book that I loved, which is why I'm having him on here, which is called It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. So Mark specializes in working with depression, anxiety, obsessive thoughts, fears, panic disorders, self-injury, chronic pain, and persistent symptoms and conditions. So And let me tell you, this work is not just for, you know, extreme situations. This is for all of us. And literally every single one of us can benefit from this and um, in some way has some form of inherited family trauma. So I'm really looking forward to all of you experiencing this. So on this podcast, we discuss Mark's own trauma story of overcoming the loss of his eyesight how inherited family trauma shapes who we are, the three steps people can take to end the cycle of trauma, and finally, you know how we all love uh, the science here at Cosmos and You, so he talks about the science and evidence behind inherited trauma. This is not just something kind of made up. There is real science in the last 10 to 12 years behind the work he's doing that is just incredible. So if you are curious about things that are holding you back in your life, um, patterns that you see in yourself or in others, in in your family or friends, um, you will be interested to hear this. And there are very specific things we could do to make shifts. I know in reading the book, I had my own shift, which I talk about in this episode that was really powerful. So tune in, let me know what you think. And without further ado, let's jump in. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Susanna. Well, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. As I mentioned in our pre-interview, your book, It Didn't Start With You, was so powerful. And I can't wait for my listeners who have already read the book or who have not yet to experience it. So I thought maybe we could get started by telling us a bit about your background and, and how you got started into this work. What set me on the path uh, was also trauma. Uh, about 26 years ago, I lost the vision in one of my eyes, and I was diagnosed with a chronic form of retinopathy um, for which there was no cure. And um, because of the way it was progressing, the doctors told me that I could expect to lose the vision in my other eye too. And as you can imagine, Suzanne, I was um, terrified and mm-hmm desperate to find some sort of help and everything I tried, um, juice fasts, hands-on healing, supplements, everything seemed to make make it worse. And um, it wasn't until I left everything I knew, my city, uh, which was Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my my family, my relationship, my job, 
I went on a search for healing that took me um, literally halfway around the globe as far as Indonesia, mm. where I learned um, from several wise uh, teachers who taught me some fundamental principles, one of which was the importance of healing my relationship with my parents. And uh, But before I could heal that relationship, I had to heal what stood in the way, but I didn't know it at the time, but it was inherited family trauma, specifically the anxiety that I had inherited from all my grandparents um, who were orphaned. E each of my grandparents was orphaned in some way. Three of them lost their mothers when they were babies. Mm -hmm. And the fourth lost her dad when she was one. So ultimately, she also loses her mother's attention. And this anxiety, this terror, this feeling of being broken from a mother's love, this was the real cause of my vision loss. And I had inherited this feeling. Um, in fact, I remember um, as far back as I can remember, maybe even five or six this feeling that had been passed forward in my family. I remember being a small boy, uh, five years old, six at the most, feeling panicked every time my mother would leave the house. Mm -hmm. And I'd run into her room and cry into her scarves and nightgowns, thinking that I'd never see her again, that all I'd have left was her smell, wow. uh, which would have been, which would have been true for my grandparents. That's, you know, I'm sure that they would have, uh, clung to some article of clothing because their mothers died. Well, 40 years later, I shared this with my mother, and she told me that she had done the exact same thing that when her mother left the house. And then my sister reading the book called me and said, honey, you did that too? Really? But at the time, nobody, your mom and your sister, nobody talked about the similarities at the time. Yeah, nor could we link it, yeah. which is, uh, you know, that, that was, uh, that's what I find in most of our cases is that we don't link. We may carry elements of a family trauma, but we don't link it. And and for me, it was the healing this broken bond with my mother um, and where my sight finally came back. And then afterwards, I felt compelled to share these principles and um, ultimately developed a method for healing the effects of inherited family trauma um, without ever thinking that would be the path I would be on. Well, so, so to back up a moment, what does – you know, if I think about listeners listening and they say, well, what does the relationship, um, the broken, you know, the feeling of abandonment have to do with his eyes? Like, like that, there's a big leap there, right? So talk to us about that. Okay. So for that, I, I probably have to describe what inherited family trauma is. Yeah, great. Um, so when we, when a trauma happens, whether it happens to us or our children, our parents, our grandparents, the trauma changes us physically. Literally, it causes, it causes a chemical change in our DNA. And this changes how our genes function, sometimes for generations. So technically, after a trauma, there's a chemical tag that attaches to our DNA, and it tells a cell to use or ignore a certain gene. And then the way, <clears throat> the way our genes are affected changes how we act or feel. For example, we be can become reactive <clears throat> or, or sensitive. Um, to a situation that's similar to the original trauma so that we can deal with it better. Um, and then these gene changes, as we're learning, these can be transmitted to our children. So I'll give you an example. If our grandparents um, came from a war-torn country, mm -hmm. um, they would develop and pass forward a skill set of sharper reflexes and quicker reaction times to help them survive the trauma. And, and if they pass it forward, it's to help us survive um, the same trauma that they experienced. So we might inherit this skill set. But the problem is we could also inherit a stress response with the dials turned up to 10. When they don't need to be. When we don't need to be, right? Preparing right. catastrophe yeah. that never arrives. And this continuous stress can be harmful to our bodies. And that was what happened to me in my eye. I'm inheriting this anxiety, this terror of being broken from a mother's love. So the skill set is, um, you know, constant anxiety, um, shutting down, um, not able to deal with the intolerable sensations of the orphan. And so this is running through my body. And not only does it get re-engineered when I'm small, which we often see, 
um, that if we have, if our grandmom has a broken bond with her mom mm-hmm. and our mom has a broken bond with our grandmom, we often have a broken bond for a number of reasons. Number one, it can be re-engineered because how can our mom give what she didn't get? Yep. But often we see a re, um, uh, a reliving or a re-experiencing of these traumas as though there's an ancestral alarm clock in our bodies that starts ringing. I love that expression. I know you talk about that in the book and I've seen you talk about it in interviews. Let's just hit for a moment. Ancestral alarm clock. Tell us what that means. Okay. <laughs> so, um, there are, <laughs> the way I like to describe it is there are signs, um, that we do, um, can be, um, affected by inherited family trauma without knowing. And people say, well, how will I know? And I say, well, there's often signs, meaning that we can be, um, uh, we can experience a fear or a feeling, um, or an anxiety or a symptom that strikes suddenly when we reach a certain age or when we hit a certain event or milestone in our lives. For, it's as though that ancestral alarm clock starts ring, 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 ring. Right. For example, when we're age 30, we start to pull away from our partner and we don't realize it because we didn't make the link, but that might be the same age that our grandmom became a widow mm. and spent the rest of her life alone or our mom and dad divorce. Um, so not only is it ages, which can um, happen, but it's also when we go to get married or when we have a child or when we first get rejected by someone or we move to a new place. I, I one time worked with this woman. Um, she was consumed with anxiety as soon as she became a new mom. Now, she had never had anxiety prior to that. Mm-hmm. So the trigger event was she became pregnant. So asking her some of the questions I outline in the book, I asked her, um, uh, w- well, we discovered that it, she had a terrible fear of harming her baby. Okay. So I asked her, did you ever harm a baby? And she said, no. And I said, did anybody in your family ever harm a baby? And she said, no. And then she said, oh, oh my. When my grandmother was a young woman, a newlywed, she had a newborn baby. And she lit a candle and the candle caught the curtains on fire and the house caught on fire and the baby was upstairs and she couldn't get the baby out and the baby died. And then she said, but we were never allowed to talk about it. You never mentioned this to oh. grandma. And this is the fertile ground when we have these events that we can't talk about. When we have events with that, there's a lot of um, uh, silence around. Dad comes back from war. Um, mom has a family, a, a trauma, or there's a family secret. These are the events that often, um, uh, are ripe or create fertile ground for this reliving. So once we knew that this woman was experiencing her grandmother's trauma, but it wasn't hers, mm-hmm. but it was regenerated, re instigated, uh, uh, came alive as soon as she went to have a baby, then we could work with it and we could, um, uh, heal, help her heal the effects of, uh, so, so the outcome was she could be a calm, stress, yes. stress free mother, which was, which was quite helpful for her. So are the signs for this inherited family trauma, are they, the signs always the same? Do they manifest differently in different people depending on the situation? Yes, they're always different. They're okay. always different. I once worked with this woman um, who attempted suicide two two times in her life, and she came to me with um, deep depression. and And I said, "Well, let's go back to these suicides. When did they happen?" And she said, "Funny you mention that. The one time happened when I moved to Kentucky, and the other time happened when I moved to Georgia." And I asked the question, "How soon after you moved?" To these places, did you have this deep um, uh, depression, this feeling to take your life? And she said, oh, my goodness, it was six months after I moved each time. So now we have some clues, right? We, what I call core language 
um, we have some clues that don't really make sense, but they make perfect sense. That she moves to a new place and six months after. So I doing what I do, which is I collect the clues or the signs when I work with people, what I call core language. I said to her, what happened six months after, around six months after somebody moved to a new place? And she said, Oh my goodness. When I was little, four years old, we moved into a new house and my older brother was six years old and he got off the school bus and got hit by a car. Mm. So when you put the pieces together, that was what would have broken the family's heart, would have broken her mother's heart, broken her heart. And she would have now in some strange reliving six months after she moves to a new place, she tries to repeat the death of her brother. Oh, boy. Not, well, not anymore, right? Right, right. And so it can be healed, healed which is what's so incredible about this. Um, exactly. Once we can find our trauma language, which is um, people will find when they read the book, that I ask many, many different questions to help them elicit this uh, trauma language that we all carry. Um, and once we find it and learn how to link it, then we can, once we make the connection, it's like finding the missing piece of the puzzle that lets the whole picture come into view and finally gives us a context that explains why we feel the way we feel. And then the, you know, in the first half of my book, I teach people how to be detect detectives. Yeah become a detective of your trauma language and then you become a detective of the traumas in your family history and then the last half of the book i i um teach the practices of neuroscience how to have a new image a new experience that can help people pull traction away from that part of the brain that's always spiraling the the limbic loop the trauma loop you know that that part of um um our brain that's um, highly developed in terms of protecting us. So in other words, when there's something terrible happening, the brain says, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. And it also yeah, it, it is creating fertile ground for this type of reliving. So we need to have experiences that pull traction or energy away from that part of the brain and then bring energy to new parts of the brain so we can heal, particularly our prefrontal cortex. So if somebody's listening, there's, I imagine there's two scenarios that I, in our listeners that I can imagine and maybe both exist at the same time. One is that a listener is experiencing anxiety, depression, fears, um, et cetera on, on, on their own end. And so there's that path. How do they start to heal that? Then the other path is that they've experienced trauma in their own life in, in, in this, in their, you know, it's, it happened to them. And maybe now they're having children themselves. So perhaps I could start with the second example is if, if there's a scenario where you've experienced trauma in your life, perhaps it could be, you know, when you lost a sibling when you were a child or, you know, any uh, example, how do you use this work to begin to heal that trauma so that you don't pass it on to your next generations? It's a great, it's a great question. So let's take the woman who did not, could not. She was too young. She was four mm -hmm. when her brother died. Yeah. This terrible trauma in her family. She would have at that point lost her mother's attunement. Yeah. She's a four year old little girl and her mother would have been forlorn and grief struck to the death of her older brother. And so there's that element of the trauma. I lose my mom's, uh, um, attunement attunement, mm -hmm. uh, tension, care, everything. I lose everything, really. Yeah. My mom and my dad are um, trying to deal with the impossible, the unthinkable. So there's that. And then there's this element of this reliving, um, which we, we I talk about in the book as one of my four unconscious themes, um, when we can identify with these traumatic events and repeat them. So there's, there's several elements here. Um, so in the work that I did with her, she had to do her work. And this would be the advice I would give. If we have a trauma, we must do our work so we don't pass it forward. 
we've got to, for this woman, she needed to have an experience of um, her mother's care um, because that's what she had lost. And she was taken care of because that's what she had lost. And, and also, how did she do, sorry to interrupt you, but um, what does that look like? How does she experience her mother's care? Okay, for many of us, which would have been my story, right? There's a whole generational experience of no mother's care. We, mm -hmm. you know, what can the, if the grandparents are orphans, what can they give? How can they give what they didn't get? Yeah. Um, so for many of us, it's in real life, real time, being able to up the ante in our relationships with our parents. Remember how I started our, our interview today? I had to heal my relationship with my parents. And a, a side product of that was my vision came back. I didn't expect it to. Yeah. I didn't even know it would. But as I began to heal these relationships, um, <clears throat> there were benefits. I became more grounded. Uh, now, uh, it isn't easy for us to heal our relationships with our parents. So sometimes we have to do it in our visualizations. Yeah. I teach people in the book many ways to do this. In fact, one of the things I teach in the book is how to receive something from our parents, even when very little was given. Mm. Uh, I think there's one example I give in the book where a woman who had a broken relationship with her mother or her mother was deceased. She, um, at bed at night, she would put a picture of her mother over her left shoulder above her pillow. Mm -hmm. And she would say, you know, mom in life, uh, you know, we weren't very close, but she said to her mother something like, um, mom, please come to me at night and hold me in my sleep. You know, her mother was deceased now that I remember the case and um, help repair the bond that broke between us so I can feel safe. Mm. And then she added other words like, mom, teach me how to trust your love, how to receive it, how to let it in. And so Susanna, after she's doing that every night, what is she doing? She's pulling trauma um, energy away from the amygdala, away from the limbic system, away from the reptilian mammalian brain mm -hmm. that's driven to keep us traumatized. And she's pulling engagement to the prefrontal cortex where we can integrate and heal and ultimately develop new neural pathways. So when she does this, and she's, we know now the new science is telling us that when we visualize an experience, our brain doesn't know the difference because the same regions of the brain activate and light up the same neurons. Whether we're reliving, I mean, whether we're visualizing or actually living it. So this woman who's lying in bed beneath the photograph and visualizing her mom holding her and opening her heart, she then is having a new experience that's changing her brain, developing new neural pathways, changing the way her neurotransmitters work, because when we do that, we can stimulate the release of uh, feel-good neurotransmitters like GABA, dopamine, serotonin, and even feel-good hormones like oxytocin and estrogen. And, and what I'm interested in is we can then change also the way our genes begin to function. Um, the, the very genes involved in our stress response can begin to develop, improve, function in an improved way. God, that's just, my, I mean, it's mind blowing when you, know, you sort of say it and it's like, oh, but <laughs> isn't it? It's just, it's just astounding yeah. oh, about the brain nowadays. It's exciting. That, that when we do practices, when we have experiences that pull engagement away from the trauma brain and bring it to the other parts of the brain, you know, we can combine it. You know, for example, if I tell people, why don't you put your hand there? We might even bring our non-dominant hand, hand there, which increases, ups the ante a little bit by engaging parts of the brain we don't use. Yeah. So there's so many things we know now about healing. And so the effects of inherited family trauma, it is about having a new experience, whether it's our trauma or whether I've inherited the trauma of orphans in my family. Yeah. So so coming back to this listener who's listening, who's had a trauma in their life, the first thing is they do the work. And, and you, you, you uh, lay that out so beautifully in the book. Uh, 
is it, am I right to say the second part is they have a new experience? Yes. Is yes. that right? Okay. okay. Beautifully put. Okay. As they do the work, they're gaining a new felt, felt, mm. stand experience in their body. And this new experience has new pra- has new feelings with it, new sensations, new emotions. And the more they practice it, you know, when we talk about Norman Doidge's work, the yeah. brain that changes itself. You know, when we practice this type of work, Susanna, um, we create new neural pathways. It goes back to that principle in 1949 by Hebb, who said neurons that fire together, mm, wire Yes. We build the synchron- synchronization of new neuro uh, synapses that are, that are functioning in a different way because of the healing experiences that we're having and then practicing. And then the third thing to do is talk about these traumas to their children because that was the other part of your question. Mm, yeah. do, your, do your work. Um, okay, for me, here's what that sounds like. Find your trauma language. Be a detective. Yeah. Go and read the book. Because in the book, I teach you how to be a detective of your trauma language. Then link your trauma language, your trauma experience, your unrealized, unexamined trauma language that's always um, ringing. It can be the ancestral language, right? Um, Now you want to have a new experience by linking it. Once you link it, then you do your work. And have a new experience of healing it, which I lay out in the book. Yeah. Then talk about these traumas in your family history and talk about it to your children. Because your children or your grandchildren just might not know. Like I didn't know why I had anxiety every time my mom would leave the house. Mm-hmm. Why my sister would have anxiety. Why we would cry into her clothing. Why our mother would cry into her mother's clothing. It's so powerful. Now, where... This is, I'm going to throw a total curveball here. Um, do past lives play any role in this? Do you believe in past lives? You, you know, how do we know? Yeah. I mean, what, what you and I believe, what I believe, I mean, really, um, it, it very well could play a huge role. We just don't have the research or the science. Yeah. And, and for me, I'm very science based. In fact, the first third of my book, I go to great lengths to talk about all the epigenetic research yes. done, all the human research and mice research that we know and that, that is, you know, you, we not now know that trauma survivors and their children have the same uh, gene changes in the exact same region of the exact same gene, mm. technically the FKBP5 gene for all those of your listeners who right. love the team. <laughs> So really, I, I try to stay as close to the science okay. as I can um, I, because there's so many things that are out now that are said, oh, my goodness, we didn't, you know, the science is new. Yeah. We didn't know this 10 years ago. We, you know, we just started learning it about 10, 12 years ago. It's wild. And for our listeners who don't know what epigenetics is, will you tell us about epigenetics? Epigenetics is... Uh, it's okay. So there's the genes that, that don't change themselves. The DNA doesn't change. So for example, the DNA sequence stays the same, but when there's been an experience, a, it, whether it's a trauma or a, um, a nutrient or an environmental, um, uh, uh, insult in some way, the epigenetics, the above the genes, can change the way that the genes begin to express. So, for example, um, they know from mice studies that um, – here, I'll tell a mice study that's very interesting. Now, mice share 99% of the genetic makeup as humans. So if a human has something like 30,000 genes, mice have something like 29,700 that are similar. So in one study at Emory Medical University in Atlanta, they took male mice and made them afraid of a particular scent. A cherry blossom scent. Okay. And the way they did that is they shocked the poor little mice every time they'd smell the smell. And then they found epigenetic changes in the brain of the mice that are designed to protect them and the next generation. For example, they found enlarged areas in the brain where there were a greater amount of these smell receptors that could detect 
the scent at lesser concentrations that, that would um, pr- protect the mice whenever they'd smell this scent. Wow. But it was also passed down this change, this epigenetic change. Now, in the next generation, not only are there changes in the brain, but there are changes in the blood and the sperm. So they took the sperm from these mice and they injected into females that were not shocked. Mm -hmm. And then they took the pups and the grand pups. And this is the most amazing part of the study. The pups and the grand pups in the next two generations, for three generations, became jumpy and jittery every time they smelled the smell without being shocked. So they inherited the stress response like we do without directly experiencing the trauma. So going back to my eye and my story, I had inherited my grandparents and my mothers and fathers because there were all the grandparents were orphans. I had inherited the stress response. But, But I'm not orphaned. Right. You see? Right. Yeah. Gosh. So again, imagining our listener, I mean, even just take myself, if I think of, you know, on both sides of the things that happen, and I think it's, tell me if it's fair to say, it seems that in generations past, they, they seem to have had, you know, I don't know if this is fair to say, but harder lives than we did, for example, right? Like there was more immigration into the country. There was more, um, beginnings. There was the depression. People died younger medicine, you know, Again, that may maybe me generalizing. I don't know if that's fair to say. Seems like we have it maybe a little bit easier now. Is that fair to say? I, I so. don't because you know we could argue also. Um, uh, you know, our country kind of has it e- ha- has had it easier, yeah. um, but not so much other countries. That's but true. also, we we have breaks in the bonds from our moms. Maybe going to um, uh, um, maybe maybe back in the day that we're talking about maybe moms put more attention and attunement mm. um, with their babies that we don't see now. That's true. So, so we don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. I think we're lucky in all areas yeah. that we'll always have enough trauma. Right. You know, <laughs> There's enough for everyone. <laughs> and everybody gets to feel something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, well, that's another question is that, um, is this inherited family trauma? Is there anyone listening that doesn't or will not have any trauma? Well, I think that most of us will have our um, something yeah. to, um, you know, I even tell people in the book, even if you don't know uh, any traumas in your family, um, it, just by reading the book, you'll learn all these skills and all these make all these connections that you didn't have prior. So some people, here's the question I get asked so often by people who say, well, I don't know my past or I'm adopted. Yeah. And, and what I always say is yes, but once you answer these questions in the book, you will know your trauma language intimately. And then you will know by the relivings that you, how you keep repeating traumas and by the language that you use to describe your life, you will know what existed in your family, even if you don't know. It, you know, so listeners, I will say that I had a big aha reading the book, just to share a personal anecdote. Um, when, when you go into the core complaint, um, so just to give everybody a little background, you talk about the core language map and that there are four steps to it. There's the core complaint is number one. Number two is the core descriptors. Uh-huh. Number three is the core sentence. Uh-huh. And number four is the core trauma. Am I right? So an aha moment that I had um, was in go- in working through the questions, the phrase that came up was, I'm afraid people will think I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. Okay. My, without going into too much detail, my, in my ancestry, I have um, mental illness where people have been, um, in mental institutions in generations past. And even me thinking about doing this cosmos anew and sort of separating myself from the norm of what people do. I tend to be fairly conservative in my life and then wanting to do this thing. The the fear was I'm afraid people are going to think I'm crazy. Mm. And then when I read that and that statement came up, I was like, Oh my gosh, isn't that beautiful? Wow. 
Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. A, that, you know, that's one of the ones, you know, that's one of the main core sentences mm-hmm. um, that people will, will um, make. They'll have the sentence that I'll go crazy. They'll lock me up. You're right. Um, they'll say I'm crazy. Um, you know, and it often connected to ancestors that have been put away. Yes. You know, back then, mm-hmm. uh, remember, women could have been put away for all sorts of things, like even postpartum depression. Right. And left to die <sighs> in institutions. And again, once, and then it's covered up, right? Mm-hmm. The mental illness, it's covered up in the family. Yep. And what, what we learn from the book is it becomes fertile ground for that generational reliving in the next generation or the next generation or even the next generation. Yes. It's wild. It really, and I mean, again, just to share with your listeners how it helped me was I felt there was almost a, a freedom of, okay, I'm not crazy for worrying about being crazy. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. there is a reason I have this fear and Mm -hmm. that it is not my trauma. Um, and that it's not a, you know, um, let me give another example. You probably heard it's the true story. And perhaps if you know it, you could tell it better, but of the Japanese soldier that lived on the Island, um, after world war two. And then I think he, he didn't know the war was over. And I believe that they found him sometime in the 1990s um, on one of these remote islands, but he believed the war was still going on. And they ended up giving him um, all these, you know, awards and medals and all this. But, but it goes to show what is happening to a lot of us is that we're operating as if the war, I put that in quotes, right? Whatever that is, is still happening and nobody clued us in that it's not happening anymore. That's such a good analogy. Right? That's yeah. so good. And, and your story is so illustrative mm-hmm. of the types of things that people discover when they read the book. They yes. they discover, oh, my gosh, I've been saying this or feeling this way, mm-hmm. but I never made the link what it's connected to. And then they, the, what you described, that feeling of freedom. Yes. That's why I wrote this book. Mm-hmm. I wrote this book for people who are struggling with things that they had no idea that they're struggling with yes. and that they, um, they don't know where to turn Yeah. Because in the past therapy did not look, you know, this is a brand new field by bio- biologically inherited trauma. This is a new field. So people didn't know where to turn. The other reason I wrote this book is I wanted to generate awareness in the therapeutic community about the impact of epigenetics Mm. because I want to see this field grow. Mm. And I wanted people to have the tools that I lay out in the book so so you so we can heal. Yeah. You know, one other scenario that can come up, um, for example, I'll see uh, I'm a mother, a mother of two, an eight year old and a five year old. And um if I see things in them, so kind of, again, common core things, like my daughter will say a lot, everybody's mad at me or something like that, some iteration of that. I'm like, Where is this coming from? How do we start to explore that? Um, I guess I, I, maybe I'm answering my own question is that we kind of become the detective, right? For yeah. our family and our um, significant other's family and sort of start to piece it together. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. You answered the question. You know, when we listen to what our children say and what we say or what our children struggle with or what we struggle with, um, it's it's essential to kind of do the detective work and say, why does this happen whenever I go away from my family? Mm. Or why does this happen um, when I, I get married? I, I one time worked with a woman. I talk about her in the book that at age 25, um, she fell out of love with her husband and at age 25 uh the grandmothers became a widow when the husband drowned and she never married again wow and it wasn't until the granddaughter linked that wow i'm not falling out of love with my right. husband i'm having an alarm clock ring an ancestral alarm clock ringing inside me um that her feelings were able to come back i'm working with children all the time parents really mm-hmm. children who are experiencing symptoms that aren't theirs. And I, you know, parents will say, can I bring my child to you? And I say, well, wait a minute, children are the symptoms. Why don't you come? (laughs) 
Yeah. And it's so important. I mean, I think you bring up a great point is that when you are a parent, it's, I mean, what more important work is there than to work on yourself so that you do not pass this on? Because they do say, you know, children are our mirrors. They are, um, right. The, Beautifully put. Yeah. Beautifully put. Just what you said. Children are mirrors and we as parents need to work on our own stuff so it's not passed forward. The more we know about these traumas and the more we can talk about them, the more we're able to bring relief to our children who have no idea what they're suffering with. Yeah. As if being a parent wasn't hard enough. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, but it is, it's such good work because otherwise it just keeps getting, you know, brushed under, brushed under and passed on. It's, it's so mm -hmm. good. And you, you know, so clearly laid it out in this book. Again, it's, it, it didn't start with you. Um, you really, you, you give us all the tools in here. Um, if people want to find out more, if they want to have a session with you, or I know you do workshops, you know, where do they find out more about you, Mark? Well, I'm located in the Bay Area. I'm located in North Bay. Um, I have my workshops, um, well, nationally and internationally. But when, when I'm here, and it's quite often, as I want to stay home more mm -hmm. than go out on the road, I've been on the road way too much. Mm -hmm. um, many of my workshops are now here in the Bay Area as well, um, whether they're at CIIS or whether they're at the Holiday Inn um, in Mill Valley, the Holiday Inn Express, I have a lot there. Um, they can find me on my website at Mark Woolen, W, M A R K, W O L Y N N, um, dot com. Uh, or they can find me on Facebook. Um, um, that's where I am. That's great. Mark, thank you so much for today. I am so excited to hear from everybody of the ahas that they had and for introducing these concepts that really don't get talked about enough and, and you lay it all in, out in such a clear and scientific way and approachable way. So just thank you very much for the work you're doing. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for having me, Susanna. I so enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. You as well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope you all enjoyed that episode as much as I did and would love to continue the conversation. So please feel free to reach out on our Facebook page, which is Susanna Scully, S-U-Z-A-N-N-A-H-S-C-U-L-L-Y. You can find us at the same Twitter handle, Susanna Scully, and also over at Instagram. And our website is SusannaScully.com. So keep it pretty simple there. Thank you all for listening in and look forward to chatting with you next time.